Get ready! You're tuned in to Tea Time Unfiltered with your girl, Lovely T, bringing you the hottest trending topics on social media. Stay connected. Instagram.com slash Lovely Tea 2002. Hey, you guys. Welcome to another episode of Tea Time Unfiltered with your girl, Lovely T. Hey, Tea Sippers. I hope you guys are doing good today. I hope everybody had a happy Mother's Day. I did. I had a good time with the boys, um, a few friends, my brother, his wife. It was a bunch of us. We all went out to dinner. We had a really good time. It was nice to just be able to celebrate together because we didn't get a chance to do a lot of stuff last year because of the lockdown. So I really wanted to talk about some troubling things that have just really been bothering me Um I remember a long time ago, if you guys are, you know, if you guys actively watch my live streams, then you all remember somebody sent a super chat. This was maybe like six months ago. And they said, TT, well, lovely T, my friends call me TT. <laughs> and they're like, you know, lovely T, what is your biggest fear as far as like the future, as far as like, you know, things happening? Do you think there's going to be a World War Three? Do you think we're going to go to war with, you know, different countries? Is it famine? They were asking, you know, these kind of apocalyptic questions. And I told them back then, this is about six months ago, I said, my biggest fear is that the next war will not be fought on the ground. It's not going to be fought with guns. It's not going to be fought with bullets. I said, everything is going to be fought with technology. And I said, my biggest fear is that what people don't understand is that the United States is so far behind with their infrastructure. It's bad enough when we think about physical infrastructure, right? So like when you think about physical infrastructure, like bridges, that's dangerous enough because a lot of our bridges are very, very old. Then they're having to put what I like to say, quote unquote, literal band-aids on bridges. They'll go in and try and melt certain bolts and fix things. But a lot of these bridges, the infrastructure is crumbling. Then I went on to talk about how 10 years ago in the Twin Cities, the 35W bridge collapsed. Folks were coming home from work and the bridge just fell out from underneath itself. And I was living in North Carolina at the time. And I ended up coming back home to the Twin Cities but um, for a little bit. But it was just really, really disturbing. And that's when I started really researching about infrastructure was way back then. So, and from what I learned even back then is that a lot of our bridges are a lot of the things that we cherish. A lot of this stuff is hundreds and hundreds of years old. And all they've been doing is putting bandages on there. Now, another part of our infrastructure that people don't tend to think about is how everything has now been transferred over to the electrical system into computers and things like that, just like hospitals. Back in the day, hospitals kept record on paper, but then that became outdated. There was always a risk of fire, you know, certain theft. So they moved a lot of that paperwork into computers. 10 years ago is when we got the big push for everything to be digitalized. So hospital records became digitalized and a lot of our infrastructure also became digitalized. And I don't think a lot of people recognize this. They tend to think about, you know, billing and hospital and, you know, uh, DSS, like, you know, the welfare system and things like that. But other parts of our infrastructure also became digitalized as well. A local hospital enters the digital age, helping folks get health care faster and safer. Union Hospital in Turo recently joined a network of hospitals that have digitized their health records. As News 10's Louisa Muller explains, it brings benefits for patients and for doctors. These racks for paper records are a thing of the past. This computer holds the way of the future in health care. Digital health records. Union Hospital joined the Indiana Health Information Exchange. It's a network of 60 Indiana hospitals that have digital health records, meaning doctors can have access to the health records of more than 6 million Indiana patients. And that's kind of what they've done with a lot of other things. So from gas companies to the grid, everything is done via computers. And the problem with that is that there's always a chance that our computer systems can be hacked. So that's what I was basically saying during that live stream. Like that's one of my biggest fears is that somebody in another country or somebody with nefarious intent, they could be here in the US too, will hack into our security systems, will hack into the grid. And if they get into the right grid, they can knock out power to the entire East Coast of America. 
I don't think they'll be able to knock it out, you know, all around the country unless it's like a major cyber attack. But one of the biggest grids is on the East Coast. And so just having just that half of the United States shut down because there's no power, if that power in the grid goes out, I mean, everything shuts down. You're talking about refrigeration, food spoiling, people not being able to cool and heat their homes. Like everything will come to a standstill. From transportation to telecommunications, healthcare, and banking, the digitization of our infrastructure has made our daily lives more convenient. But it's also opened us up to the threat of cyber attacks. Electricity is so prevalent in our lives that we often don't even think about it until it fails to work. All electricity starts at a generator, which can be powered by wind, water, coal, or even nuclear fission. After it is generated, the electricity travels from the power plant to transmission substations, which convert it to a very high voltage so that it can travel long distances. From there, the electricity travels along power lines to another transformer, which again converts the power, this time to a lower voltage, before it goes into our homes and businesses. In a conventional warfare attack, the first thing that is hit is the infrastructure. The refineries, the electrical systems, the chemical plants, those things that fuel the war machine. You can simply do the same thing remotely with cyber weapons. It seems like attackers have crossed the Rubicon or they've crossed the red line in the sand, you know, that they are going after control systems, whereas once uh, no one cared. Today, there are more than 9,700 power plants in the U.S. Many of them were built decades ago when operating a plant required a lot of manual labor and cybersecurity was not a consideration. But that's changing. Starting in the mid-80s and early 2000s, the industry started connecting these control systems through the enterprise networks to the internet for the benefit of remote access, information sharing, etc. Fantastic for productivity improvement and business enhancements, but that exposed us to cybersecurity threats. Since 2010, the number of attacks have increased exponentially. The reason for it is that it's a lucrative business for ransom attackers as well as for nation states. A 2015 risk report put out by the University of Cambridge and Lloyd's, a large insurance company, posed a hypothetical scenario in which a cyber attack plunged 15 U.S. states into darkness, leaving 93 million people without power. The report estimated that the loss to the U.S. economy would range between $243 billion to $1 trillion. Well, now, if you guys don't know, Devin was one of the first ones who posted this on the Discord. This past Friday, a major U.S. pipeline was hacked. The Colonial Pipeline, which is the country's biggest fuel pipeline, has shut down all operations since Friday. Now, I've been telling you guys now for the past few weeks that we are going through a major shortage in the U.S. Right now, we have a gas shortage, okay? And the reason why we have a gas shortage is because, one, there's a lack of drivers, when everything got put on hold last year because of the lockdown, that put a kink in the supply chain. So the drivers, the supply chain, and now we have a huge cyber attack. So this is very, very scary. So this is just another thing being compounded onto everything that we've already been going through. So I want y'all to go ahead and watch these video clips real quick. Check this out and I'm gonna come back with the rest of my commentary. So have you noticed a uh, shortage in drivers lately? For the last few years, yeah, not lately. Priscilla Korea owns her own company and truck, but leases a forward air trailer. She and her Hi. wife and two dogs drive for months at a time. It's definitely not a job everyone wants to do. I mean, you're away from family, you're away from friends, you're away for holidays. Korea says the never ending truck driver shortage was made even worse by the pandemic. A spokesperson from AAA says the demand is up for products now that more people are vaccinated and traveling again. So the demand for truckers is up too. And with that increased demand, I think that's putting a little bit of a strain on um, on the overall supply chain. Not necessarily that there's not enough gasoline, 
but there might not necessarily be enough drivers to get that gasoline to all the gas stations. It's one of the nation's largest fuel pipelines, this morning remaining largely shut down after falling victim to a cyber attack. Two sources familiar with the matter tell NBC News a Russian criminal group known as Darkside is the leading suspect in their ransomware attack on Colonial Pipeline. Veteran cybersecurity experts say the scope is unprecedented. Colonial says it's developing a system restart plan and will be fully back online when it believes it's safe. Over the weekend, the Biden administration convened an intra-agency working group to investigate and get Colonial back online. It's an all-hands-on-deck effort right now. Colonial is an energy giant with more than 5,500 miles of pipeline, supplying roughly 45% of gasoline, diesel, and jet fuel to the East Coast. Ransomware attacks are on the rise as hackers lock users out of their own systems, then demand payment to restore access. Already targeting retail stores, hospitals, police departments, state and local governments. This is not uh, an attack that uh, was unforeseen. Many in the industry uh, have been warning against this. Now, members of Congress are calling for urgent action. The implications for this for our national security um, cannot be overstated. This needs to redouble our efforts as a country to focus on things like critical infrastructure uh, in the future because this is only going to continue to happen more often if we're not careful. The question for drivers, could the shutdown lead to higher pump prices? Experts say the longer the pipeline is shut down, the greater the chance for supply chain issues and potential price spikes at gas pumps. For now, though, industry analysts are urging motorists to resist hoarding or panic buying. If everyone goes out and fills their tanks up, if they fill buckets of uh, buckets from Home Depot of gasoline, uh, then we're going to have a much, much bigger problem uh, that will last longer and lead to more price spikes. Although Russian hackers often work for the Russian government, according to security experts, in this case, they believe this is strictly the work of a criminal gang, a very sophisticated criminal gang. Uh, Savannah, they actually have seen dark side train freelancers and then give them a cut of the profits as they work on these ransomware attacks worldwide. Back to you. It's so scary in its implications. And then when we're talking about this shutdown continuing, at some point you'd think that gas prices would be impacted. What do you expect? Well, we've talked to uh, the ga folks at GasBuddy.com. They think that probably five days is the number we're looking at. If this extends beyond five days, prices could start to surge. Back in 2016, we had a pipeline shut down for 10 days. And in that case, we saw gas prices jump about 30 cents in Georgia alone. So they're watching this very, very closely. All right. So you guys just watch those clips. So it's really scary. But I also feel like the media is just dumb when it comes to certain things. Gas prices, if you're watching, if you're actually going out and, and putting gas in your car, gas prices have already been going up. We've been talking about this on Discord for the past two months. Gas prices have been shooting up in the South. It's been shooting up up here in the Twin Cities. When I got gas the other day, it was damn near $3. It was about two eighty dollars something. So it's gone up because of the supply chain issue plus the driver shortage so you mean to tell me that if one of the biggest gas pipelines in the country is down for the for the next few days because they don't have any plans on coming back up yet because this was a major ransomware attack they're acting like oh well gas prices may not go up where the hell have y'all been gas prices have been going up for the past two months i'm not saying it's going to jump from you know 285 to five bucks but it's definitely going to affect a lot of people you know what I'm saying? And if people start hoarding and start trying to just collect gas and, you know, take all their gas cans up there, it can definitely cause more issues. So this is just really unnerving all of the things that's going on in 2021. Like I said, in 2020. Yo, what's up? Baby, let's go. Hey, T-Sippers. To listen to the rest of this podcast, please go to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, Tuned in or anchorfm.com, which is a free podcasting site. Thank you guys so much for the support and stay tuned for the next video.